When you think about the structural etiology, I like to compare congenital to acquired. So cleft palate and oncological head and neck uh, cancer. And if you think about um, speech motor processing, you have to remember that children who acquire speech at the presence of unoperated cleft lip and palate or palatal fistula or the hisses operated but the surgery came open, will have a different motor speech processing than in a, a person which could be a child or an adult that do, acquire, do have to remove the soft palate and uh, um, uh, due to a, a oncological a tumor in their uh, soft palate or pharyngeal walls, whatever it is, the cancer located. So this person with an acquired structural anomaly uh, already developed speech using a, uh, let's say, a typical uh, um, oral motor uh, uh, anatomical structural system compared to the patient I'm going to show you. And please do not copy or, or, uh, my images. I do have permission from Lucas to share his name, his images. He was going to connect with us and uh, he uh, could not. And he's eight today. So I'm talking uh, to you about his case. And Lucas uh, was born with a unilateral, complete cleft lip, lip and palate. He operated the lip and reconstructed the uh, nasal ally, the, 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 air, the side of the nose, the nares of the side of the cleft when he was five months old. And then when, when he came uh, at 13 months, he came to uh, 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 do the palatoplasty and did that surgery. And then he returned when he was 24 months for an assessment after the primary palatoplasty and everything uh, came apart, the hissense we had. He had complete dehiscence of his primary palatoplasty. And this, this, uh, the, the importance of this, the impact of this in his speech was huge. He had another palatoplasty and end up with a fistula, a huge fistula that involved the hard palate and this, this soft palate. And uh, it, it, he ended up only with uh, mucosa at this area of the soft palate. Can, can they see my person? Yeah, I think we have changed the- Oh, it's okay. I, I, uh, what you see, uh -huh. just trying to show you with a- Sir, it's not okay. showing. Yes. So here is what he has a soft palate, and there is not uh, much muscle, and this doesn't work. Okay. So he tried to uh, um, before coming here. Here he is, forty-eight months before coming. He did another surgery, and this is what we got when he came. Then um, he couldn't stay for a speech here. He lived at the uh, Sao Paulo city, the capital. And he came to uh, the program where I work, which is the intensive speech therapy program when he was five years, 11 months, almost six years. And um, remember, he has a huge fistula. He has villopharyngeal insufficiency. And even though he really had three surgeries trying to repair this, but he has no possibility of, of closing the villopharynx. So he has no possibility with the anatomy that he has, he cannot close the villopharyngeal mechanism. And all his speech was acquired at the presence of oral nasal coupling. That is, he could never separate the mouth from the nose, never. So during his first year of life, cleft was not, the cleft palate was not operated. The second year of life, he had the hissens. The third year of life, he had fistula and uh, insufficiency. So he acquired what we call 
in um, uh, mislearning, velopharyngeal mislearning. For him, um, speech motor processing does not involve the velopharynx. And because the muscles of the soft palate are the muscles that open the eustachian tube or auditory tube, uh, he had a, a um, tube dysfunction since birth. So how do you think his speech is? Let's see here. I hope we can, you can. Paciente é... E esse bicho quem é? Paciente LFBRG. How do I make it louder? It's the loudest. Paciente com fístula de palato, irada... Quietinho, Lucas. E esse? Uh, esse. Tartaruga, fala. Uh -huh. Tartaruga. E esse? Não? Uh, Rihanna. Não conheço. I hear it, Jennifer. Tartaruga. Uh, Arthur. Uh, Olha. Arriel. Esse. Hum, devagar. Que cor que é esse peixe? It is hard to, to, to hear, it's not, I don't know if it's all, the quality of the sound, but you're not seeing the patient, uh, but he's making the um, um, articulatory place of production at the pharynx. He uses pharyngeal fricatives and for plosives, he uses glottostops. And uh, when uh, we got him a year later, Jennifer, uh, hold on, because I know that you are, tu eres genia en hacer esos sonidos. Do you want to, do you want to give an example yes. of what he would, because you do that so well. So if I'm going to say puppy, and I use my glottis to generate pressure, I will say uh -uh, uh -uh. a little burst of air is not uh, um, um, consonant deletion. The consonant is just made in another place. So it's not uh, e, uh, e. It's uh, e, uh, e. If I want to say Susie, and I use the back of my tongue against the posterior pharyngeal wall, I will say and a lot is almost a, 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 um, a Brazilian R, but we make it um, towards the villum, not towards the uh, uh, posterior pharyngeal wall. So what this child did for the consonants, he manipulated the air pressure before the air escaped through the uh, fistula and uh, insufficiency to the uh, insufficient velopharynx. Okay, uh, of course, nasal air escape made any sound that he was doing orally, which are, were very few, usually liquids, he made them li uh, uh, weak because he divided the quantity of our air uh, pressure between nose and mouth for oral sounds. And then we, we have the resonance component that there is no way that he would have um, uh, uh, balance between oral and nasal resonance. All his oral voiced sounds had a nasal component. Um, if we could get this child as we did, uh, this is his plan for treatment, but uh, after all these surgeries, we decided to develop a palatal obturator for the fistula and later on uh, a, uh, a obturator that, that went into the area of the uh, velopharynx. So uh, this is uh, not his x-ray, but uh, the, he obturated the fistula in this area. And then he had a floating material of acrylic uh, uh, in the velopharyngeal area. And then now he's ready for speech therapy that has to address the speech motor planning. We have to tell the brain that because now he has possibility of closure, he can use this mechanism to generate pressure and then move away from this area where he's making the fricatives 
and the glottal area was, where he's making the plosives, okay? So he is, he, when he was seven, uh, he, this is an oral view um, with the appliance. So this is without the appliance, you can see the fistula and what was uh, left here. And then looking from, and, and these images all here are with the nasal endoscope looking from the superior view. So a little bit of uh, adenoid tissue and, and the villum would be here and the lateral walls would be here. And then we put the acrylic material of the obturate, obturator or speech bone, as we say in the uh, uh, North American literature. And then we guide him through speech and it is like uh, teaching him a second language or a dialect variation actually because he's not speaking English or Spanish, but he's speaking, um, he's making his sounds with a diff in a different manner, okay? Uh, so I amplified here, looking from top, from nasal endoscopy, I believe you all know what, what this exam is if you're in the master program. So here's a prosthesis, looking from the top. Once the child develops normal speech with the prosthesis, we start a reduction of size program with speech therapy and with the help of a dentist, we start working with two speech bulbs, one that he closes normally, his speech is normal, and the other one is slightly smaller, and we keep doing that until we get to the maximum and he cannot uh, close anymore, then uh, we know the size of the uh, tissue that the surgeon needs to put there to replace the prosthesis. This is a pharyngeal flap. It's a type of uh, secondary surgery in which you take a piece of uh, mucosa from the posterior pharyngeal wall, and then you suture inside the villum. It has to be tailor-made in size, so it's not very large, and the patient develops apnea, because uh, uh, it will be there forever. Uh, it has to be the right size. So the walls on the sides will come and close to in this uh, uh, flap of tissue, okay? So Lucas uh, is not in this stage yet, but he got rid of all his, his uh, uh, glottal stops and pharyngeal fricatives. And he's now, uh, because he has a cleft, the, the cleft has a lot of, um, uh, comorbidities. So um, conductive hearing uh, loss is common because of the eustachian tube dysfunction. So we monitor him every six months. He put that a lot of equalizing pressure tubes. We have to monitor because equalizing pressure tubes are great, but on the long term, it can get um, tympanic membrane uh, uh, pathologies. So we have to use as minimal as possible. So when we do therapy with him uh, and he's not with equalizing uh, tube, we use an FM. So he listens himself with an FM. Or we just amplify with tubing, depends on what we have handy on therapy. Other uh, uh, important thing is because of so much manipulation of the middle third of the face, uh, the, the, this is not Lucas, okay? I just got from, the, um, uh, from our uh, literature. So the upper third of the face and the lower third of the face develop normally, but the middle third, which is represented here in the upper jaw that is retrogated, um, develop very, uh, um, develops many, many, um, much less. So the more you operate, the worst is the development of the maxilla, okay? So well, Dr. Will... Duca, Dr. Yes? Duca, so I just wanted to, to uh, share with the class. So I've talked, I think I've talked to this class, I'm not sure. So this was my surgery, remember? Uh -huh. well, back okay. surgery. So that is a surgery where I have, I, I used to not be as cute as I am right now, actually, but I, this whole part of my face is reconstructed. Um, for other reasons, um, Bell's palsy, but this is the uh, surgery. So I'm really glad that you're um, talking a little bit about it. Before the surgery, we work with the orthodontist. So we prepare as much as, as we can. 
He does uh, expansion anterior posterior and, and, and uh, uh, transverse. And in the line of the cleft, they do, um, uh, uh, they put bone so the incisors can um, um, erupt. Otherwise they lose the incisor in the line of the cleft. And then after the face is, uh, has it stopped growing is that they do final treatment with orthognatic surgery. And then at last, they will do the final uh, rhinoplasties. Okay, this, the nose uh, will be repaired at last. So we follow them uh, using, we score how they are throughout the treatment. And we look into, uh, into the, the lips, we look into the nerves, uh, we, we look into the um, uh, nose appearance, and we look into the profile. And then we classify the uh, dental, rela uh, uh, dental occlusal relationship of the patients. So here's the best possible relationship, and here's the worst possible relationship. So you imagine where the tone is when he's making uh, 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 anterior sounds. It's either back, usually with the cleft, they are already back doing pharyngeal uh, uh, fricatives and pharyngeal stops and all those uh, backwards place of production. Or if they, sometimes the tongue bypasses and, and, and do interdental placement, okay? So there are many things to follow in children with a cleft lip and palate. So how is the villopharyngeal function? How is the dental occlusal uh, uh, condition? And how we, are they developing aesthetically along with how they do in school? Are they getting bullied because of their speech, speech or because of their appearance? Uh, um, are they getting difficulties, learning difficulties? Is this related in any way to the speech uh, uh, disorders that they have? And so I had to just brush it up. Now I would have Lucas uh, introduce himself and he's pretty much uh, uh, intelligible. Uh, he's, he's speaking all his sounds orally, but he's making uh, expansion of his uh, maxilla, so he's without the obturator uh, because of the daily uh, uh, appliances that he wear to expand anterior, posterior, and transversally the maxilla. And what he says when he talks to us is that he doesn't, he can't wait to get his speech bowl back because he lost all the pressure in his mouth, and uh, his voice sounds funny. He's hypernasal. So um, we are thankful to Lucas and his mother because even though they didn't connect with us, they allow us to present to you. And we don't do this as a team of speech pathologists alone. We have a group of surgeons, dentists, psychologists, uh, um, the team of uh, uh, um, uh, nurses, and occupational therapists during feeding. And of course, during each surgery that they come to the hospital to do uh, is incredible. The geneticists, uh, most, in most cases, cleft lip and palate is not part of a syndromic case, but when it is, then we have a team of geneticists to work with us, to help the families and to go throughout the um, treatment. Uh, we do have physical therapists. Uh, we have a person that works with learning on the pedago pedagogy. We would say pedagogia, Linda. Pedagogy. It's uh, like um, education, pedagogy. Yeah, yeah. an education yeah. specialist. I, I, lo I lost the, the um, I said about the dent, all specialties of, all specialties of dentistry, of course. In uh, MDs, for the surgeons, the pediatricians, uh, the, ah, we have nutritionists. I always forget to talk about my colleagues nutritionists because many um, uh, patients come for surgery and they are not in nutritional when they are babies. They are not in nutritional condition to endure the surgery. So what we do is work with the parents before the, the, the date of the surgery and um, the team of nutritionists is outstanding. So we are eager to have you here.